The date, April 6th, 33 AD. The place, a hillside just outside Jerusalem. In this sealed tomb lies the body of a man who was brutally beaten, repeatedly tortured, and finally killed in an agonizing crucifixion. His name was Jesus. Did Jesus of Nazareth rise from the dead almost 2,000 years ago? That is probably one of the most controversial questions in the history of man. Over the centuries, Christianity has grown from a handful of disciples to one of the world's major religious forces. Today, one-fourth of the world's population, over one billion people, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Still, there are those who insist he never existed, that he was a myth, and others who say he was a teacher or prophet, but not the Son of God. Doubts like these have been expressed for centuries. But today, new questions have captured the imagination of millions of ordinary people, as well as scholars and scientists. For on August 27, 1978, the most sacred relic of the Christian world went on display in Turin, Italy. It is known as the Holy Shroud, the faithful claim it is the actual burial cloth of Christ, and it has become the center of a raging controversy. Why? When a photograph is taken of the shroud, the blurred image on the cloth is somehow mysteriously transformed into the remarkably sharp image of a man. And many people believe that this is the face of Jesus Christ. What is the shroud? Can it shed light on man's constant search for the truth, or is it just an elaborate hoax? Did Jesus really exist? Was he the expected deliverer of the Jews, the prophets called the Messiah? Did he perform miracles, as the Bible reported? And what about the missing 18 years of his life that the Bible didn't report? What happened during the so-called silent years? Is the shroud authentic? And if it is, is it proof that Jesus rose from the dead? In search of answers, we have interviewed scores of scientists and scholars, spent years in research and sent film crews around the world. In this motion picture, you will see the results of those efforts. Most of what we know about Jesus is contained here in the Bible. And so our search for historic Jesus must begin here with the Bible itself. But just how accurate is this document? Can the Bible be treated as history or a collection of fables? Is there any modern evidence to support these writings, which go back 4,000 years in time? To find out, we will study the Bible itself, beginning with the first chapters of Genesis and the story of Noah. 
are told that God was displeased with the world he created. Only Noah and his family, and one male and female of every living creature were to be saved. After 375 days, the ark came to rest on the slopes of Mount Ararat, where Noah went forth to repopulate the world. The story of Noah according to the Bible. Is it true? Is there any scientific support to this Bible account of a worldwide flood? In 1929, during an excavation at Abraham City of Ur, Archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley discovered that beneath layers of successive civilizations, there was about 18 feet of mud, mud without a trace of human presence, and beneath that, traces of an earlier civilization. Many scientists believe these discoveries prove there was once a worldwide flood. So the story of Noah, according to the Bible, is given historic validity. The Bible tells us that God told the descendants of Noah to dispense and multiply. But instead, the people decided to build a tower which would reach to heaven and make the people equal with God. Angered by their disobedience, God then destroyed the tower with a terrible vengeance. Recently, archaeologists have discovered what is said to be the actual site of the Tower of Babel. Here we can see the ruins of the foundation. The Bible also tells us the story of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. God instructed Joshua to march around the city of Jericho for six days. Then on the seventh day, city of Jericho, scientists have discovered the remains of the wall. But the most substantial proof discovered to date to authenticate the Holy Bible was made in 1947 by a goat herder. It was in the cliffs of the Wadi Qumran near the Dead Sea, where a goat herder was searching for a lost animal. What he found instead was one of the most remarkable archaeological finds of all time. Inside an earthen jar was a leather scroll wrapped in linen. What he discovered would be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. By the use of carbon dating, we know that the Dead Sea Scrolls were made between 168 BC and 233 AD. Their importance? Well, they corroborate almost every book of the Old Testament, and they predate all other existing records by hundreds of years. So the Old Testament proves to be a remarkable historical document. And it is here that we shall begin our search. For hundreds of years, the prophets of the Old Testament foretold the coming of a Messiah. They said he would be born in Bethlehem and raised in Galilee. He would be known for his ministry of healing and the miracles he performed. But he would be rejected by his own and put to death. But the question remains, was the expected Messiah Jesus Christ? It was here in Bethlehem, exactly as prophesied 800 years earlier, that Jesus was born. We are further told that a new star was recorded in the heavens to announce the birth of the Messiah. And three wise men from the east saw it and followed it to Bethlehem. Shepherds in the field brought their flocks and came to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. For an angel had told them that in the city of David, there has been born a savior who is the Messiah.
word of the Messiah's birth reached and angered Herod, king of Judea. What is the meaning of this? It is the fulfillment of the ancient Hebrew prophecy. Where was this child born? It is said, Bethlehem. What has been done? Our soldiers have searched, but the Hebrews seem to know little. Hebrews. Always the cursed Hebrews. They mock me. Their zealots dare to rise against me. Now you tell me they have a Messiah. Surely, wise Herod, you do not believe in these Hebrew prophecies? I am the king of Judea. I, Herod. No Hebrew will ever rise against my rule. Perhaps then we should consult our own astrologer about that star. You would not know where this Messiah is now, would you? No, my lord. And what if the Hebrew prophecies are true? Surely they would hide and protect this Messiah. But we shall order further searches. No! Must be sure. There's a better way. Kill them all. All the newborn Hebrew males. Your Majesty! Up to the age of two. But that will bring down the wrath you of... You challenge my command! I am the king! No Hebrew will ever contest my rule. Star of Bethlehem. It signaled the birth of Christ and heralded the deaths of thousands of innocent children. Did it really exist? Is there some scientific explanation for this astronomical phenomenon? To find out, we came here to talk to Dr. Robert McLean in his observatory. Well, there are three astronomical theories which could explain the appearance of the star of Bethlehem. Now, the first is a comet, or fireball. The star that appeared was so bright that it washed out all the other stars from the sky. Now, a fireball is an extremely brilliant meteor, and when it lands upon the Earth, it turns into a meteorite. Do you mean that this meteor might have hit the Earth? That's right. And if it was a fireball, we're left with a fascinating thought that the star of Bethlehem may be buried on the Earth itself. Hmm. And the second possibility is a nova, or the appearance of a new star, where no star was ever seen before. Ancient Chinese records show that a, a nova appeared in April of 4 BC in the constellation of Aquila the Eagle. Now, the third and most promising possibility was proposed by Johann Kepler in 1603. He discovered that at the time of Christ's birth, there was a conjuncture between Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter which would have produced the effect of an enormously bright light in the heavens. Then you believe there may very well have been a star of Bethlehem? Definitely. So there is scientific support for the biblical story of the star of Bethlehem. And our story can continue. Jesus was saved from death at the hands of Herod's soldiers when Joseph had a dream warning him to flee. He took his family to Egypt and they did not return to Israel until after Herod was dead. And as prophesied, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus settled in the town of Nazareth in the province of Galilee. In the years that followed, Jesus grew with a wisdom beyond his age. On Passover, he accompanied his parents to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when he was 12, 
he came to the attention of a man who would be intimately involved in his life and death. Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee and member of the temple council known as the Sanhedrin. So, you young men have uh, made up your mind to become a rabbi, eh? Yes, Master. Now you prepare to learn, my boy, to spend many hours with your head in studies and prayer until one day you raise your bearded chin like one of us. God be willing. Well, you, uh, I've asked profound questions. Now tell us, what kind of a teacher would you be? What kind, Master? Yes. There are those who teach religion with arrogance. Those who teach that we must do our duty to God. Those who teach that we must obey Jehovah out of fear. And those who teach love. I know what kind of teacher I wish to be. Tell me, my boy. You know the story of the pagan who came to a rabbi and said, I'm willing to become a Jew, but I'm in a hurry, and you must teach me the whole law while I stand on one foot. The rabbi sent him away. Then the pagan went to a second rabbi and said, I'm willing to become a Jew, but you must teach me the whole law while I stand on one foot. The second rabbi said, Do unto others as you would them do unto you. That is the whole of the law. The rest is commentary. I wish to be like him, Master. Nicodemus, he, uh, he speaks like a bearded one already. Son! Son, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know I would be about my father's business? Since the New Testament was written many years after Jesus' death, there are certain gaps in the story of his life. The largest of these gaps is called the missing years, the ages between 12 and 30. Of these 18 years, the scriptures tell us almost nothing. But other sources and legends have come to light which seek to fill this gap. The result is a collection of fascinating possibilities. The Aquarian Gospel, written in 1907, and said to be derived from the Akashic records, states that Jesus left Israel at the age of 12. This map shows the route taken by Jesus. The Akashic records say his journey included a visit to Persia, modern-day Iran. According to the Aquarian Gospel, it was here that Jesus stopped to see the three Magi who had visited him at his birth. Their meeting was a great holy occasion, and a light brighter than the light of day surrounded the Magi. Such an event is called a transfiguration. Another possibility comes from a remarkable discovery made by the Russian explorer Nikolai Notovitch at the end of the 19th century. In a Tibetan lamasery, Notovitch learned of the visit of the prophet Isa, who taught that all humans are equal before God. These ancient scrolls said that Isa, or the Christ, was a divine child born of poor parents who talked of a one and indivisible God, how he journeyed from Jerusalem and joined a caravan of merchants headed toward India. Here he sought to improve and perfect himself in divine understanding and to study the laws of the prophets. While no tangible evidence exists of Jesus' life to illuminate the missing 18 years, there is one legend which seems anchored in more than just conjecture. And curiously enough, its roots go once again to Joseph of Arimathea. These are the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey in Somerset, England, as they stand today. Centered around this abbey is a widely accepted legend. It is said that the young Jesus had left India and then traveled to Britain with Joseph of Arimathea, who was a merchant seeking tin. At the time, Britain was the major provider of the world's tin. Joseph of Arimathea has been referred to as a decurio, a common Roman term designating an official in charge of metal mines. Medieval sources report that a church was built there under the direction of the young Jesus. 
A semblance of credibility is given this legend by the fact that here stand the ruins of a church which dates back to about the time of Christ. The Glastonbury legend goes on to say that after Christ's death, Joseph of Arimathea returned to Britain. Among the group that supposedly accompanied him were Lazarus and Mary Magdalene. Tradition tells us that Joseph, weary from his travels, thrust his staff into the ground and that the staff became part of the earth and in time blossomed. Today, this 2,000-year-old tree stands at Glastonbury, the only thorn tree in the northern hemisphere to bloom at Christmas time. Joseph of Arimathea is said to have been buried on this site, and in 1367, a Lincolnshire monk recorded that the body of Joseph of Arimathea was found at Glastonbury. The crypt and body, reportedly that of Joseph of Arimathea, were rediscovered in 1928, and today reside here in the chapel of St. Catherine's at Glastonbury. In matter of historical fact, the events of the missing years must be largely conjecture. But we can assume that it was during this period that he developed his mental and spiritual powers. The Bible next tells us of Jesus when he goes to visit John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a noted prophet in Judea. His sermons had been so moving that he soon had a growing band of followers. But his pronouncements angered Herod Antipas, the Roman ruler of Judea, as well as the Hebrew high priests who were jealous of John the Baptist's growing popularity. Repent and believe in the one true God. Repent and reform your life. What should we do? Let the man with two coats give to him who has none. Let the man with food share with him who has none. John, we come from Jerusalem at the request of the Sanhedrin. We wish to ask one question. Are you the Messiah? No. Then who are you? A voice in the wilderness crying out to be heard. You have not answered our question. I baptize with water. But there is one who is to come after me whose sandals I am unworthy to touch. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and in fire. He dares to herald the Messiah. Do they believe him? Yes. He excites the people. He also excites Herod Antipas for speaking out against him. For that, shall be forced soon to pay dearly. Repent and cast away your sins. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John! Will you baptize me? Come forth. I should be baptized by you. And yet you come to me. This is the way it must be, if we are to fulfill God's commands. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You are my beloved son, and in you I am very proud.
there is the Lamb of God. It is he whom you must follow now. The mission is fulfilled. He must increase. While I must decrease. Shortly after this meeting, John the Baptist paid the ultimate price for his beliefs when an enraged Herod Antipas had him beheaded. Next, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights of prayer. God's command, Jesus came here to the synagogue of Nazareth, where he had lived as a child, to begin his ministry. While many look on, he reads the prophecy of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Therefore, he has anointed me. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and comfort to those who mourn, and to announce a year of favor from the Lord. Today, in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. The prophecy of the scripture can be fulfilled only by the coming of the Messiah. Yes. Behold, the kingdom of God is upon you. It comes in a way not foreseen by man. Dare a carpenter's son from Nazareth claim to be a prophet? No prophet gains acceptance in his native place. You defile the house of the Lord. Blessed is he who accepts me. I come not to abolish the laws and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Master! Master! I am Andrew. This is Peter. We come at the request of John the Baptist. We wish to serve you. Where are you from? Capernaum, we are fishermen. Come then. I will make you fishers of men. Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow, they do not reap. They gather nothing into barns. And yet, your Father in heaven feeds them. He knows all that they or you need. Seek him and his way of holiness and all will be given to you. For you are the light of the world. A man does not light a lamp and then hide it under a bushel. He sets it up on a stand to light the way. In just such a way, your light must shine for all men. Blessed 
are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus went out among the people to spread hope and teach of a better way of life, as God had told him to do. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. To the blind he gave sight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Can you help me, please? And he healed the sick. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to cure this man. As you stand pure before God, you are cured. He raised the dead. Lord, if you had been here, I know my brother would never have died. I am the resurrection and a life. Whoever believes in me, even though he should die, will come to life. And whoever believes in me and is alive, will never die. Take away the stone. Lazarus, come out! the Messiah. Who else could bring a man back from the dead? We must tell Caiaphas. Yes, but who would believe it? I myself saw Lazarus dead. Caiaphas must be told. Word soon spread about the wonders performed by Jesus, and his popularity grew. You have heard it said that you should love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. For your Father in heaven makes the sun rise 
on the evil and the good and causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those that have been persecuted in the name of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. During his ministry, Jesus went from village to village preaching the kingdom of God. It was on one of these trips that he met a woman who would play an important part in the rest of his life. Her name was Mary Magdalene. He's coming, the one called Jesus. He's coming. The man from Nazareth. Please, where is he? You think he'd heal the likes of you? Please, please. Was it his sin or that of his parents which caused him to be blind? This man has not sinned. Neither have his parents. Rather, it was for the works of God to show forth through him. Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. I have been blind from birth. You see, Caiaphas, he continues to gather crowds. Some people think upon him as the Messiah. I have ordered all who so proclaim barred from the temple. Go now and wash in the pool of Siloam. continued to spread about Jesus. His teachings were repeated by his followers, and the tales of his healings convinced many that he was the Messiah. But the most talked about feats performed by Jesus were the miracles. Wait, Lord, we'll come to shore. No. God's power will bring me to you. Jesus taught that faith was a prerequisite to miracles. He promised his disciples that they too could do wondrous things as long as their faith did not falter. Through the miracles of Jesus, his disciples soon learned that he had mastery over the elements of the earth. The boat is taking on water. Apostles Peter, James, and John held a special position of leadership among the Quorum of the Twelve. Often, Jesus would take them with him when he went into the hills to pray. You have done well, my son. 
have set an example for all to follow. But your great mission has only just begun. For now you will face the true test. You must show that through me, all may achieve eternal life and everlasting salvation. Know, my son, that you will suffer mightily. For the way of the Lord is not always an easy one. As Jesus' fame increased, Herod Antipas grew to fear the growing reputation of Jesus as the Messiah. But your highness, I, I saw it with my own eyes. A sham, a lie, a fabrication, a veritable charade, I say. Yes, sire, it might have been. You take me for a fool. I'm a pagan, like you. One must be hysterical to believe in the miracles of this Jewish God. Yet there are some who say that this Jesus is John the Baptist risen from the dead. They also call him the Messiah. Even the temple priests fear him. Only last week, the Jewish high priest, Caiaphas, demanded that I arrest them for blasphemy. But they have no authority in Galilee. They would have me send him to Judea. Let Pontius Pilate crucify him. Pilate would never kill Jesus, not for the priests. He despises them. What about treason? Is there truth in that this Jesus harbors zealots among his followers? Yes. In fact, we caught one just this morning, seeking sanctuary with him. Good. Then he plots against Rome. Shall I have him arrested on those charges? No, no, not yet. We'll lay this back into the hands of Caiaphas. Herod says he'll go along with whatever we decide to do about Jesus. Well, where do we stand? We must act against him. This Jesus of Nazareth performs such miracles as would have the people believe he is the Messiah. If we allow this man to continue, soon all the people will follow him. Tiberius Caesar will think that we approve and accuse us all of treason. The Romans will destroy the temple and make pagans of us all just as they have done with other nations. No, no, we can pray. There is another way. Let this self-appointed Messiah die for the people. No, Caiaphas, no. Why should the whole Jewish nation perish? The nation will not perish. Listen to me. I know this man. No harm must befall him. No, I say he must die. Oh, yes, he must die. He is a blasphemer. I will not jeopardize the safety of our people for the life of one man. He is sure to come to Jerusalem on the Passover. Keep watch. Advise me of his whereabouts. When the time is right, we will seize him. Let's go to Jerusalem. The whole city is waiting. It smells like spikenard. It is, Judah. A waste of money, my lord. Money that would best be given to the poor than used in this manner. I would have her sell it. Let her be, Judas. She has bought it in preparation for my burial. heralded by the people of Jerusalem. They were convinced that he was the Messiah and would free them from Roman enslavement. However, 
When Jesus entered the temple and found it had been turned into a marketplace, his pronouncement surprised his supporters. Is it not written in the scriptures that my house shall be a house of prayer for all the people? Well, they have turned it into a den of thieves! Beware those scribes who neglect justice and mercy! No. Who take the savings of widows and then recite lengthy prayers just to keep up appearances. Oh. Oh. No. Beware their parading and their fancy robes, their front seats in all the synagogues, their places of honor at the banquets, for they are hypocrites! Behold then, your house will be left empty. And you will not see me again. The people were shocked. Instead of leading them to freedom from Rome, Jesus had attacked the high priests. Their belief that he was the Messiah was shaken. Sensing this opportunity, Caiaphas and the other priests made their plans. It was the first night of Passover and the apostles gathered with Jesus for the meal. But a feeling of fear and apprehension filled the room, for each disciple knew that Jesus' actions in the temple had sealed his fate. What they didn't know was that one of them, whose faith had faltered, had been influenced by Caiaphas and lured by the promise of money into becoming a traitor. I have so looked forward to sharing this Passover meal with you. Before my suffering begins. Take this bread and share it among yourselves. This is my body, given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Blessed art thou, O Lord, master of the universe, who has given us this fruit of the vine. My brothers, there is one among you who will betray me. Who is that, Lord? Among us, Lord? Lord, who is it? It is one who dipped his hand with us in the bowl. you do. Do it quickly. Later that night, Jesus and a few of his disciples went to a garden called Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. Stay here. 
que importe. Oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass by me still. But if it may not pass away from me, unless I drink it, then your will be done. The time is at hand, my son for your great trial to begin. As your suffering increases, remember that what you do will act as a light to show the way for all mankind. With Judas' kiss, the soldiers provided by Caiaphas knew which of the men was Jesus. from my bed. He has subverted our people's belief in our God and in the laws of Moses. Yes, but religious matters are hardly any concern of mine. You deal with him according to your laws. We have, Procurator. But under Roman law, only you can pronounce the sentence of death. Death? What, over a religious matter? <laughs> Procurator, if you were not a criminal, we would not have disturbed you. But he has opposed the paying of taxes to Caesar, and he calls himself the Messiah, a king. The king. <laughs> Bring this uh, king before us. Are your words. No, those are their words your own people handed you over to me. But it is you who call me king. Well then, what are you? The reason I was born, the reason I came into the world, was to testify to the truth. I find no case against this man. But this man is a threat to the authority of Rome. In the interest of justice, Caiaphas, yes? Why then do we not let your own people decide? Isn't there a custom whereby I may release one prisoner at your Passover time as an act of mercy? Yes, Procurator. And did I not condemn for murder one of your uh, zealots? Barabbas. Barabbas, yes. Very well. I will give them the choice. A messiah or 
a murderer. Hmm? And the decision will be theirs, not mine. Uh, bring Barabbas in to me. Hearing of Pilate's decree, Joseph of Arimathea and Mary, mother of Jesus, hurried to the temple. But Caiaphas had instructed his priests to fill the crowd with their supporters so he could be sure of the outcome. I have decided, in honor of your custom of Passover, to release one of these two prisoners as an act of Roman mercy. You shall tell me which one. Shall it be Jesus, King of the Jews? Anyone for him will know the wrath of the temple. Or shall it be Barabbas, guilty of murder? Responsibility. I wash my hands of this man's blood. Though the Romans had no real interest in the crucifixion of Jesus, the soldiers made a great sport of torturing the so-called Messiah. They crowned his head with thorns. They whipped him repeatedly, then led him through the streets of Jerusalem. Crucifixion was a common punishment of the time, and on this fateful Friday, two thieves were to be crucified at Christ's side. tied to the cross, as was the case with the two thieves. But the Romans nailed Jesus to his cross to further humiliate the king of the Jews.
Friday morning at 9 o'clock, the second day of Passover, Jesus was crucified. He saved others, yet he cannot save himself. King of the Jews! <laughs> With the Son of God, show us. Come down from the cross. <laughs> then we will all believe you. At noon, the bright sun became obscured by clouds, and it began growing dark. Behold your son. I've seen enough.
It was almost sundown when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus returned with a cloth in which to wrap Jesus' body for burial. As Hebrew law forbade burial after sundown on the Sabbath, Joseph had to work very quickly. Once the body was removed from the cross, there was no time to wash it. They hurried to a tomb that Joseph had originally intended for himself. The body was then prepared according to Hebrew custom. The shroud and the body were treated with oils and spices, and a cloth was wrapped around the face of Jesus. Then the whole body was covered by the shroud. It was three days later when the greatest miracle of all took place. that Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. The first appearance was made on the evening of that Sunday, but Thomas, one of the twelve, was not there. When the others told Thomas of Jesus' visit, Thomas was unbelieving. Eight days later, Jesus came again. To the doubting Thomas, he showed the marks of the nails in his wrists. And he showed Thomas the wound in his side. As you have seen, you believe. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. The story of Jesus according to the Bible. Jesus appeared a third time to his disciples at the Sea of Galilee. But other sources have claimed that later he appeared many other places. Some documentation to this effect is to be found in the Book of Mormon, 3rd Nephi, chapter 15, verse 21. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe the American Indians are descendants of the lost tribes of Israel, and that Jesus appeared, saying, And I said of you, I have other sheep who are not of this fold, and they also will hear my voice, and there will be one shepherd and one fold. Did Jesus visit the New World? This jade head of Quetzalcoatl, an Aztec deity, bears a remarkable resemblance to the Jesus image on the Shroud of Turin. Indian tribes in both North and South America refer in their folklore to a bearded white god who visited them years before the known arrival of white men to America. The Algonquin Indians tell the story of the Pale One, whose name they repeated as best they could, Jesus, and they named the Dawn for him. A tribe of Navajos tell of a healer who visited them and spoke of the one God whose name was Jehovah. There are many other stories about a bearded white man always wearing a robe, healing and teaching. Similar stories come from India, Japan and England. These stories are told too frequently to be ignored. There seems little doubt that Jesus did exist, that he was not a myth. But what about the crucifixion? Is there any physical evidence to substantiate the Bible on the death of Jesus? Did he die on the cross? Was a spear thrust through his heart? 
And what tangible evidence could there possibly be for Jesus' resurrection? The answers to all of these questions might have been lost forever in time, except for one thing. A single item. The Shroud of Turin. The modern story of the Shroud begins in this small attic room of Secundo Pia, an attorney and skilled amateur photographer. He had been invited by church fathers to take the first picture of the Shroud. What he was about to see was the most amazing and puzzling picture in the history of photography. Instead of a negative appearing on his plate, the unbelievable image was a positive. This meant that the image on the Shroud had the qualities of a photographic negative. Pia stared in awe at the miracle on the plate. Could this picture, taken by Secundo Pia 80 years ago, actually be a picture of Jesus? Or is it just an elaborate hoax? To find out, we must go back and trace the known history of the shroud. History records that around 30 AD, a burial shroud, which contained what was believed to be the image of Christ, was discovered in Odessa, Turkey. This unusual relic came to be called the Mandilion. But as Christianity grew, so did the persecution, and church officials began to worry that the shroud would be destroyed. So church officials had it hidden in a wall. AD, a devastating flood swept through Odessa. sent from Constantinople to repair the city walls. And the shroud was rediscovered. Next, the Mandelian was taken to Constantinople, where it was displayed periodically. It was during this period, historians feel, that the Mandelian was first unfolded, revealing the full shroud. It remained in Constantinople until the beginning of one of the bloodiest periods in world history. In the 11th century, European Christians took up arms and went to war to take control of the Holy Land from the Muslims. This holy war was known as the Crusades. Then in 1204, Constantinople was captured. The Crusaders began to sack the city. It is believed that this is when the Shroud was first seen by Westerners. Supposedly, it was taken back to Europe, where it came into the possession of the de Charny family, who first exhibited it in 1357. The first documented evidence of the Shroud came to light in 1398, when a French bishop wrote a letter of protest to Pope Clement VII. It seemed a public display of the Shroud was being planned for Liray, France. Since the rise of Christianity, Europe had been flooded with phony relics, a practice that flourished well into the Middle Ages. Against this background, the Bishop of Troyes had branded the Shroud a painted fake. Nevertheless, the Shroud was sold to the Duke of Savoy in 1452, and on June 11, 1502, it was placed in the St. Chapelle Chapel at Chambray. But in 1532, a fire broke out, threatening to destroy the Shroud. <laughs> Miraculously, the shroud escaped destruction, but the molten silver from its box badly scorched the fabric at the edges, which in places had to be patched by the nuns. In 1578, the shroud was moved to Turin, Italy, and later placed in a special shrine designed by Garino Garini in the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. It has remained here ever since.
The shroud has been displayed periodically over the years. In 1978, over three million people came for glimpses of this remarkable relic. What they saw was a linen cloth, 14 feet 3 inches long by 3 feet 7 inches wide. On the cloth are two head-to-head -head negative impressions of a human form. Both the back and the front of the body are clearly visible. As one moves closer to the shroud, what he sees defies explanation. The dark areas are the burn marks from the 1532 fire, framing the pale, subtle pattern of shifting shades, which clearly show the image of a man. Is this fascinating relic genuine? Or is it a gigantic hoax foisted on people who want desperately to believe in it? Exactly how was this remarkable negative image formed? And what formed it? To find out, we went to see Ray Rogers, a physical chemist at Los Alamos, New Mexico. Early in October of 1978, a team of researchers from the United States were allowed five days to study the Shroud of Turin. Now, classical scientific method involves the development of hypotheses. How can something have occurred? And testing these hypotheses against hard observations. A number of things can be learned about the Shroud before the Shroud itself is actually observed. There are four main hypotheses concerning the appearance of the image on the shroud. The first of these, brought forth by Bishop Henry of Poitiers in, in 1357, is that the shroud was a painting. The second is that the image was produced by direct contact of cloth with a body or a statue, something of this sort, that was coated with a material. The third one is that vapors or liquid products from a decaying body were absorbed by or reacted with a cloth. And the fourth one is that the image is a result of some kind of a heating or scorching phenomenon. Now you can observe with regard to the painting hypothesis that the heated scorched area from the fire of 1532 has not caused any change at all in color or tonal density of the image in the area that was scorched. Water was dumped on the, uh, the shroud as it was uh, being destroyed in 1532 to put out the fire. The water migrated through the cloth and nothing in the image moved with the water. This says that chemically there cannot be or cannot presume to be any of the kinds of painting pigments, vehicles, or media that would have been available to a forger before 1350, and that nothing was produced by or used that could have been water-soluble. Now, this rules out almost all of the things we can think of that could have been used uh, in a painting mode. As far as the hy hypothesis of vapor causing the image is concerned, you can see that the image is the result of many little individual spots of color. These are not connected. If material had diffused or percolated by capillary flow into the cloth, the color should be continuous. The spots should all be in contact one with the other. This is not the case. Strangely enough, the only hypothesis that is left at the moment is that, or the most likely one at the moment, that the image could be the result of some kind of a heating, scorching phenomenon. Ray Rogers told us he thought the image was formed by some sort of heating or scorching phenomenon. For more information on that, we went to see British author and journalist Jeffrey Ash. What you can say is the body of Christ could have formed that image if something extraordinary had happened to it, so that it released a burst of radiation, producing an, a scorching effect on the cloth. Now, of course, this does not happen to human bodies in the ordinary course of events. But according to Christian doctrine, of course, something extraordinary did happen to this particular body. By some process we cannot understand, it came to life again, the resurrection. So perhaps that miraculous change 
would have released a burst of radiation which marked the cloth. But here we are getting into something where science must be silent. We can only say, on the basis of my experiment, the shroud could be as it is if it once enwrapped a human body to which something extraordinary happened. So according to Mr. Ash, the events of the resurrection do offer a logical explanation for the appearance of this image. But is it the shroud that Jesus was buried in? After all, thousands of people were crucified in and around Jerusalem in that time. Is there any way to prove that this is the image of Christ? To find out, we traveled to Scotland Yard and spoke to Professor James Cameron. As a forensic pathologist, he uses his expert knowledge of the human body to examine corpses and help the detectives solve crime. We asked him to examine the shroud. Professor, you mentioned finding evidence on the shroud that the body was whipped. How do you know? Uh, as uh, is known, if it were a Roman uh, that was being flagellated, they would have been whipped with a cane or a rod. Uh, if it was a non-Roman, probably 40 strokes. Uh, but with a Jew, it could be anything up to 120 or more. And in this particular shroud, it has been calculated that there are marks of 120 uh, lashes. So we can be sure that the image on the cloth is most certainly that of a Jew. What other identifiable marks did you find? Also, uh, one sees that there are marks on the head uh, here, which have come from uh, the crown of thorns. Uh, this would suggest that uh, be more in keeping with the Gospels that he was crowned the king of the Jews. Ah, yes. The bloodstains can be seen very clearly on the forehead. Are there any additional marks which correspond to the biblical account? Well, it was the normal practice when uh, one had to, when one was crucified, if one was walking and was being pushed and shoved, one would automatically possibly fall more onto the left knee and the left forehead. Uh, and it is uh, surprising that one can see that there is an abrasion on the, fore on the left forehead, swelling of the left cheek, bruising of the upper right lip, uh, and there is also an abrasion over the uh, left knee. And all this can be seen on the image of the shroud. Uh, yes, Professor, that does support the Bible story which says that Jesus fell while carrying the crossbeam and the soldiers made a Cyrenian named Simon help him carry it to Calvary. What evidence have you found relative to the crucifixion itself? If one, uh, working from the Gospels, one realizes that um, a person who was crucified in the first hundred years AD, there was no heel bar and therefore he would have to be suspended by the nail through his feet uh, or through his heel, but in this image's case, it was obviously through the feet. What about his hands? In this particular image, uh, rather than through the palm of the hand, as uh, many artists depict it, it is through uh, the wrist, but one must remember that it, uh, in many times in the past, one considered the wrist as part of the hand. So if the uh, nail was through the, uh, the middle of the hand and the body was suspended on the hand, there was only the minor ligaments between the joints, uh, between the fingers, and the nail would quickly slip through. But if the nail was through the wrist bones and the multiple bones of the wrist, it would have to fall through the whole of the hand, and this would be impossible. So in every case, whipping, the crown of thorns, bruises from carrying a cross, and the scars on the feet and wrists, in every case, the person who was wrapped in this shroud has marks which match perfectly with what the Bible says happened to Jesus. Professor Cameron, do you believe the shroud is authentic? I th do not believe that anybody, uh, at or about the time of uh, the finding of this cloth in the beginning of the 14th century, uh, that there would be anybody with enough in... Uh, the know-how of the tech, anatomical, photographic, and uh, painting and forging ability to be able to uh, forge uh, this um, shroud. Uh, that could have lasted to this day. So we know that the shroud has been scientifically placed in Jerusalem during the first century AD. And we know that the image must have been put on the shroud by some incredible burst of energy. 
such as might have been generated by the resurrection. And now we have seen forensic evidence that shows that the marks on the body depicted by the shroud match in every detail the biblical account of the suffering and crucifixion of Jesus. Modern science continues to try to give us clearer and clearer pictures of the Shroud of Turin. In 1976, using the technique of computer image enhancement, two scientists, John Jackson and Eric Jumper, discovered that the density of the image on the Shroud varied in intensity in direct relationship to its distance from the body. This is the result of their experiments, a three-dimensional likeness of the body within the Shroud. And this is the three-dimensional face of the shroud created by British photographer Leo Valla. Combined, we are given a remarkably clear image of the man buried in the shroud, an image that many believe is that of the man known as Jesus. The Shroud of Turin is an incredible help to us in our search for historic Jesus. And as our knowledge increases, the world of science promises more startling discoveries from within the fibers of this incredible cloth. But the shroud is only one aspect of the historic Jesus. We must never forget the essence of the man himself. We have his teachings, his healing the sick, raising the dead, his miracles, and his final sacrifice for the sake of man. Jesus was all of these and more. His words and his actions have been a model for billions of people for almost 2,000 years. You became a believer because you saw me. Blessed are they who have not seen and have believed.